thank you for the invite and uh, for listening to me. I know it's after lunch, so I know I've got to be kind of energetic and keep you guys awake. Uh, one of the things that I love talking about is being an entrepreneur and working for myself and uh, starting some different things because I want to encourage everybody, everybody I know, my cousins, my family, you guys, I want everybody to uh, work for yourself, start your own business. Uh, even if you're working a full-time business, I think everybody can uh, have a side gig, a side hustle, a podcast, a blog, all that good stuff. So I uh, want to encourage everybody to, to do that kind of stuff. Uh, real quick, Tony was talking about um, the definition of an entrepreneur, and I've been using a new definition on a lot of my stuff. Um, I'm calling myself an indiepreneur uh, because there are a lot of different categories of entrepreneurs. And so when I became an entrepreneur, which was around uh, 2000, 1999, 2000, somewhere around there, I made a decision to be an indiepreneur, meaning I was going to work independently all by myself. I wanted to be able to sit at home in my underwear and do whatever I wanted, not have to meet with people, not have to have an employee, not have to go, you know, somewhere. I just, I just wanted to stay independent. So luckily, uh, except for a couple of things that I've done in between uh, now and then, I've stayed pretty much independent. So I kind of considered myself more of an indiepreneur. And the cool thing about that is anybody in this room can make a living as an indiepreneur. It's a low uh, amount of uh, startup cost. Uh, you can do it right from a computer. You can do it from your phone. So I'd encourage everybody to do that. So I'm going to talk about three things, hopefully real quick. Uh, tell you guys my entrepreneurial journey, because if you listen to my journey, you're going to know that anyone in this room can start their own business. Because if, if you hear what happened to me and I still made it, anybody can make it. Then I'm going to tell you a little bit about Enid Buzz, uh, try to go over kind of what I've got going on there. And then um, I've got, uh, since this is the uh, vision for 2020, I've got 10 things that I'll briefly tell you that I see my vision for 2020 as far as e-commerce and entrepreneurs. And then kind of a special bonus at the end. Hopefully I can squeeze all of that all in and maybe take one question, but maybe not. But um, so I was the guy, uh, we're talking 19, so I'm 57. Uh, and I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up. So if that means anything to you guys. Um, so I was a guy in the 1970s walking to Waller Junior High School, passing Fitzsimmons Convenience Store uh, by myself, had a dollar in my pocket. So I'd go in and I'd buy 50 Jolly Ranchers, two cent Jolly Ranchers, and I'd go to Waller Junior High and I would sell them for five cents. So after school, then I go back to Fitzsimmons and I had enough money to buy myself a candy bar. So that's how I funded my snacks after school all through junior high. So that was kind of my beginning. Um, somewhere in junior high, I discovered magic, and I thought, wow, it would be cool to become a magician. So, uh, and, and you know, everything that I'm going to be talking about for the first half of this was before internet, phones. I mean, you just had to do all this stuff on your own. So um, I ordered the Mark Wilson course in magic and started learning magic. I watched magicians on TV. I went to the Enid Public Library and I rented magic books. And so I did everything that I could in junior high to learn how to be a magician. And so I started my own magic show and I would have magic shows in my garage at the corner of Broadway and Johnson. And I'd charge the kids in the neighborhood 25 cents to come watch my magic shows. Well, it started to get enough popular that I had parents that were calling me and they would invite me to do magic shows for their kids' birthdays. So started this little magic business, and then my best friend from sixth grade wanted to join in, so he became my magic assistant. Well, he could sing and play guitar, so he would sing and play guitar after the magic tricks, and then I had puppets, and I would do a puppet show. So we had this whole thing. You know, I was the Jim Henson of the day. Uh, even got so into it that I was even creating and sewing my own puppets at that point. So we did all that through junior high, did birthday parties, churches, uh, made money that way. Got into high school, and it was not cool to be playing with puppets anymore. I was not Jim Henson. So I gave up the uh, puppet thing. Uh, we started a garage band, did not make any money with the garage band, but it was a good learning experience. Went through high school, started drawing. Uh, every time the teacher would leave the room, I would run up and I would draw cartoon characters all over the chalkboard and then sit back down. Um, and was drawing cartoon characters for my friends on notebooks and stuff and kind of named this little company at that time Cartoon. So it was my name Curtis and Cartoon, so I invented the name Cartoons and that's what, what I was doing. And one of my friends, I pre created a character for him called Real Neil. And so what he did was he went down, he had some actual t-shirts printed up and we sold those t-shirts. So that was my first you know, jump into uh, that kind of stuff. So got through high school, was doing a lot of cartooning, logo design. So to this day, I have never not had a side gig of doing logos and cartoons ever since high school. So I've always, no matter what I've done, I've always done cartoons and logos for people on the side. 
so I left Enid High School, graduated from here in 1981, went over to Northern Oklahoma College, uh, took two years of art over there, had no idea what I wanted to do when I grew up. I didn't know how I was going to make money with art, but um, I knew that was kind of what I was interested in, so I stayed in it, got my associate's degree, went over to OSU, 84 with Garth Brooks, we were all partying over there, got nothing done for a year, thought, okay, I've wasted a year uh, of my life. And so I started asking around, I said, where is the best graphic design department in Oklahoma? And this was uh, 84, 85, and they said Central State University. University of Central Oklahoma, it was Central State University at that time. So I transferred down there. Luckily, I had uh, goofed off and done so much other stuff throughout the years that I had every class that I needed out of the way in three years, except for art. So I got to spend two years, I was on the five-year plan, I got to spend two years at Central State University and never left the art department. Every class was art. So I got through there, thought I was ready for graphic arts and, and a job, uh, you know, after that. So I graduated in 1986 after five years of college. Um, first job that I got, I went down to Dallas for a while, couldn't find a job. It was at Catch-22. You don't have enough experience, we can't hire you. You don't have anything in your portfolio. And I'm like, I can't get anything in my portfolio unless you hire me. Sorry. So I came back to Oklahoma City um, and I started working for a silk screening plant because so we'd done the, you know, I'd done the t-shirt. So I was doing silk screening. Uh, we were mostly printing large uh, decals for like the size of trucks and a lot of stickers for radio stations and things like that. So I did that for a year, but that got me kind of into, into the profession. Uh, transferred to a big print shop where they were laying out grocery ads. Uh, for grocery stores and retail stores, and so I was in the layout department. Well, back in that day, that was about, um, oh, when would that have been? Uh, 85, 86. Um, we'd have just a plain white board, just a flimsy board, and you had to use border tape to, to put the boxes on the, on the thing, and then you'd get artwork and you'd put wax on it, you'd stick it all over the board and you'd put a sheet over it and you'd write on it what you wanted the typesetter to typeset. And so a typesetting machine was literally just a machine that typed out words and they would just run out on a piece of paper. You know, that's, so, um, so got into that, was doing that, uh, did that for two years. And uh, then I guess by then I was up to 1989. So in 1989, I decided, okay, I, I, enough of this. I, I got that itch that Tony was talking about. And I, you know, I felt like I've got to do something else. I want to do something fun or something. Uh, I was always trying to improve whenever I got a, a job. So, um, so here, if you don't believe in fate, um, this will make you believe in fate. So out of the blue, one day in 89, I decided I'm gonna look for a new job. So I go to the Daily Oklahoman and I look in the job section and there's a job in there for a job in Enid, Oklahoma. I mean, what are the odds that there'd be a job for somebody in Enid, Oklahoma? You know, I was looking for a job in Oklahoma City. Uh, but I saw that job and it was a blind ad. So I didn't know what the company was. They didn't want anybody to know what the company was. It was up here hiring. So I thought, and it was for advertising director, which I, you know, was I really an advertising director? Probably not, but you know, you gotta go for it. That's, the, that's being an entrepreneur or doing these things. You gotta, sometimes you have to take a risk. So I took a risk and I applied for the job and I get this phone call and this lady says, Curtis, I said, yeah. She goes, this is Betty Evans. And I said, well, hi, Betty, because I knew Betty Evans. And she said, uh, I'm, you know, I'm up in Enid, and we're the ones running the ad for the uh, director of advertising. And I was like, oh, wow. Well, Betty Evans was bringing the ads for Evans down to my job in Oklahoma City, and I was one of the people that was actually helping her lay it out. And then it was getting printed and shipped back up to her. So she knew me personally from being in that department. And she, so she said, well, will you come up and interview? So I came back to Enid and interviewed for the job. Again, fate, and then eventually married her daughter, so she became my mother-in-law. So <laughs> there's fate for you. I mean, I could have opened that paper any other day and found a job in Oklahoma City and stayed there. Anyway, saw that job. So anyway, so 1989, I moved up here to Enid, Oklahoma, became the advertising director at Evans Drug. At that time, they were a uh, pharmacy chain had three stores in Enid, one in Ponca City, one in Woodward, one in Edmonds. Um, but, you know, after the oil boom, there was the oil bust. So, unfortunately, just as I started working for them, we started closing down stores. Um, but anyway, I worked for them. The first, you know, the first week that I was there, I had to lay out an ad. So I laid out the ad just the way that we used to with the wax and, and all the stuff. And we'd send it. So then I was sending it back to Oklahoma City to the job that I had had before. And uh, so I sent off the first ad and I was kind of waiting for it to come back and somebody came into my office and they said, hey, you know, before that ad go comes out, you've got to enter the UPC codes into a sales batch. 
I said, all right, what's a sales badge? They said, well, it's this database on a computer and you put the UPC codes in there and the sales price. And I said, cool, what's a computer? <laughs> 1989, five years of college, three years of work, I'd never turned on a computer. I'd never seen a home computer. So I'm going to tell you guys, it's never too late for, for, to learn things, to pivot. So 1989, turned on my first computer. It was an IBM XT running on DOS. Probably most of you don't know what DOS is, but it literally is just a black screen with a blinking cursor. That's all there is on there. So you would type in whatever the name of the program is. It would pop up. It was black as well. You just type in the numbers. You type in the price. It would go into the system. All of the registers would know what was on sale and what the price was. But the cool thing about that was I instantly fell in love with the computer. I mean, I thought it was so cool that I could copy and paste and format and all these little words that I could type in and it just, I was like, my mind was blown. I didn't know how to, I didn't even know how to type. I'd never had a typing class in my whole life. So, you know, I'm, I'm plucking around and doing all that. So fell in love with the computer, started researching it a little more. Uh, wasn't long after that, I went to my boss and said, hey, you know, there's these new computers that have this thing called Windows on it. We ought to buy it. So I told my boss, he said, well, let's buy them. So we bought brand new computers for the whole office with, with, with Windows. I learned Windows, taught everybody in the office what Windows was. Uh, a little bit later, uh, doing more research, uh, a program came out called PageMaker. And I went to my boss and said, hey, there's this new program where you can actually typeset the ads yourself. And then we'd save that money on sending it down to Oklahoma City. He said, okay, buy it. So I bought it. Uh, learn PageMaker on my own. A little bit later, Corel Draw came out. You could actually lay out the entire ad on your computer. No more wax, no more border tape. You lay out the ad, everything on the computer, and you send the disk down to Oklahoma City. So I started doing that. So basically, just started learning more and more about the computer, more and more about graphic design. I learned that all graphic designers in the world but me was using a Macintosh. So I bought a Macintosh, uh, Apple Macintosh. Knew nothing about it put it in my office at home and it sat there for exactly one year. Never turned on because I didn't, I didn't know what to do with it, but I knew I needed one. So I bought one. So then somebody came out with this cool software where you could install it on a Macintosh and you could divide the hard drive into two partitions. Half of it would be the Mac side and half of it would be a Windows side. And you could install all of your Windows programs on a Macintosh, but run it through Windows. I thought, well, that's pretty cool. So I got rid of my PC put my Mac on my desk, put you know both sides of it, and so I continued working on what I was doing on the PC side, but every time I had a little bit of time, I'd jump over to the Mac side and start learning it, so I started learning Macintosh. Eventually, I learned so much Macintosh, I learned that nobody should be working on a PC and everybody should be on a Macintosh, and I've never gone back to a PC since. So when people ask me to come do something on Windows, I, I'm like, I don't know, I just literally don't know anything about PCs anymore. So I'm all Mac, so I started working on a Mac. Uh, I switched over to Adobe Photoshop and Illustrator, uh, learned all that. So, so all of this I'm learning on my own. So if you want to be an entrepreneur, on one, in one sense it's easy. There, there's uh, limited, you know, you can get in real easy, but there's a lot of hard work, there's a lot of learning. If you, if you want to be a guru in, in your niche or something, you've got to take it on yourself to learn this stuff. You, you don't want to just sit there and, you know, if, if you're going to be the employee that just does what needs to be done until five o'clock and then you go home, you're going to be an employee, which is fine. But if you want to be an entrepreneur, you need to be the one in there that's that's learning more than the other guys. And then eventually, you know, more than your manager and then your boss realizes that and fires the manager. Then all of a sudden you're the manager and then all of a sudden the company fires the boss and you're the boss. I mean, that's just kind of how it works if you want to be driven and you want to be an entrepreneur. So anyway, so I did that for 10 years. Um, and then again, I got that itch and I thought, and the whole time that I've been doing that, I was still doing cartooning and graphic design on the side. Uh, that's why I had the, the Mac at home. And so I got that itch after 10 years. So now we're up to 1999. And in 1999, I kid you not, I woke up one day and I looked at my wife and I said, I think I'm gonna switch jobs and I'm gonna become a cartoonist. And she just rolled her eyes and said, okay, see it, see it five. And I said, okay. So I started drawing cartoons. I mean, I was drawing them, you know, every chance I got during the day. So the only way that I knew how to make money at that time with cartooning that was going to be quick was to draw single panel <laughs> cartoons and mail them off to magazines, bless you. And so I started sending them off. And what you do is you draw 12 cartoons. You'd have to come up with a gag. So in the cartooning world, anybody can draw a cartoon. 
it's the writing that makes the cartoons funny. So you have to be a really good writer to be a good cartoonist. Because, um, any, like I say, anybody can draw stick figures. So anyway, but so I'd send off 12 to one magazine. While that was going off, I'd draw 12, uh, draw 12 more, send those off to another magazine. So this one was going to the National Enquirer. Second one's going to Reader's Digest. The third one's going to Tennis World. And it's just a lot of mailing, a lot of waiting. So I, I sold a few, but you know, $25, $50 here, there was not enough to pay the bills. Um, so I kept going, uh, was spending a lot of time, a lot of money on postage. In 1999, uh, I heard that companies and people were, had their own websites. And I thought, well, that sounds kind of cool. What if I took all my cartoons and put them on a website and emailed the editor and he looked at the cartoons online, would he buy them from me? So uh, there was a company here in town called um, Harvest Communications, and they were the ones in town building websites for everybody, and a guy named Robbie Johnson was building them, and he said, hey, I need a cartoon logo for a group of golfers. Uh, we got this thing going on. Will you do a cartoon logo for me? And I said, sure, but I'm going to trade you. I'll do the cartoon logo if you will build a website for me and upload my cartoons to it. He said, okay, I did the cartoon logo. A uh, couple weeks went by and he never, he was just so busy building everybody else's websites, he couldn't build a website for me. So he came over one day with his box that had software in it, and I still to this day, still trying to track it down, I don't know what the name of that software was, but it was really bad, uh, the old HTML days. Set it down, he said, here, learn this and you can build your own website. I was like, okay, so I go to networksolutions.com, 1999, and I buy cartoons.com take this software out, I learn how to build my own website. So I build my own website, it's got all my cartoons on there. Um, I threw through, uh, on the second page, I put a few of the cartoon logos on there. And uh, back in that day, believe it or not, this was before Google, and so we had Hotbot and Alta Vista and Open Directory Project. Those directories were our search engines, but they didn't spider the internet. You had to go to the search engine and submit your website, otherwise you weren't gonna be in the, the search engine. Then when they put you in the search engine in your category, it was alphabetically. So everybody had all these triple A names like in the phone book, you know, triple A plumbing. That's why people did that in the phone book, so they would be first. So that's how bad search engine, that's why Google did so well when they came out because search engines were really bad. Uh, before Google came out. So, but anyway, what I did was I went around to every search engine I could find and I found every website that was built by a cartoonist and had a cartoonist on there. And I decided that I was going to build the biggest cartoon directory online on my website. So that was going to be part of my website. So I started, and so back in that day, we traded links. So you'd go to a cartoonist, you'd email him and say, hey, would you like to trade links? He would say, yeah. And so I built the largest online directory of cartoonists on the internet. I mean, there was not a cartoonist in the world that had a website that wasn't in my directory. So I uh, was building that, wasn't selling any cartoons. All of a sudden, Google comes out. It's all over the news. Everybody's using Google. Well, guess what the number one ranking factor for Google was the minute it came out of the garage? Backlinks. Backlinks. Who had the most links for the keywords? Guess who had the most links for any word? with a cartoon in it, I did. So I ranked number one for cartoon logos, cartoon characters, cartoonists, cartoons. So I, all of a sudden I had this huge amount of traffic coming in from Google. Well, I went to my boss and I said, hey, things are kind of starting to take off. I'm gonna quit, have to, I'll work for you in the morning. I'd had a kid, so 2000, by then, 2002, I had a, a, a daughter and I was bringing her to work and I said, how about I work for you in the morning and I'll go work for myself in the afternoon. He said, okay. So I was doing that, I was doing uh, the work at Evans Drug in the morning, and then I was doing, still trying to make money with the cartoons and graphic design and things online in the afternoon. And uh, so one evening I was at the YMCA here in Enid, and I was reading a magazine, and this article caught my attention, and it said, these two guys had built websites and they were making $5,000 a month with their websites. I was like, wow, that's pretty cool, how'd they do that? So I read the article, one was a high school student and he had built a website and he was reviewing cameras. And so he would, you know, have the camera, pictures of the camera, all of the benefits of, you know, his reviews and everything. The other guy was taking commercial airlines, the diagram of the commercial airlines, and he would put them on different web pages and show you where to sit so you wouldn't die if the plane crashed. So these two websites were getting so much traffic that they were making $5,000 a month. Well, how were they making the money? It was Google AdSense. So by then, about 2003, 2004, Google AdSense had come out, and I thought, wow, that is really cool. So that night I ran home, signed up for Google AdSense, got my little code, put it on the homepage 
of cartoons.com, went to bed, woke up, and I wish I remembered the amount. It was probably something like 37 cents, but I tell you what, man, when I opened that account up and there was 37 cents in there and I hadn't done anything, to, that was like a gold mine. I was like, wow, I can go to bed, wake up and have money in my account. So I thought, so back in that day, again, websites were built with HTML. You had to update every stinking page one at a time. You know, there was no database driven WordPress and things we have now. Everything's so easy now. Um, so I went to every page of my website and added that code. Next day, I'd like made two or three dollars. And I was like, wow, I'm starting to make money. I am an online entrepreneur. You know, I'd make almost five bucks. But in my head, I was like, well, you know, if I could make two or three dollars a day with this website, couldn't I make like six dollars a day with two websites? So I built another website. And then I built another website. And then I built 100 websites. So all through the 2000s, I built 100 websites. And so my job at that time was to wake up every morning, figure out a way to make money so I didn't have to go get a job. And that's exactly what I did. So I built 100 websites. Um, the only way that I was able to do that was they were thin content websites, meaning I knew SEO, like the back of my hand, search engine optimization. So I could get a website ranked for anything that I wanted other than like New York real estate. Um, a number one in the world for baby furniture at one time. So a lot of different words. So what I, my job was to find keywords that were highly searched for, meaning I would get a lot of traffic, but there was the least amount of competition so I wouldn't have to be battling on a lot of other websites. So I was finding words like tattoo designs with the word tattoo misspelled. Half of the United States does not know how to spell the word tattoo, so they would just use one T. So I ranked number one for tattoo designs for years and years, made a lot of money off that website until spell check was added to Google, and then that website collapsed overnight. So this is what I did for, you know, websites would come up and they'd go down, they'd come up and they'd go down. So I had a, a website where I did nothing but list suggestions for what to name your dog. Uh, babydognames.com was the name of that website. And so basically what it was, it was just information with a lot of Google ads all over the website. And the reason that I made the website thin content is because you wanted to have enough content and keywords to get Google to rank you for those keywords, but you didn't want to have enough stuff on the page that people would stop and they would be done. You wanted them to click on an ad and have to go to another resource to find what they really wanted. And so the cool thing about Google AdSense back in that day was if you had a website about baby stuff, every ad on the page was about baby stuff. Nowadays, if you search for Cancun and you go to a baby website, you're going to see ads for Cancun. They switched it. But back in my day, every ad on the page had to do with what was on the page. So when somebody would come looking for a baby crib on my classic baby store website, if they didn't find the crib they wanted, there would happen to be an ad for another crib they would click on and then Google would, so Google AdSense would pay me. So Google AdWords was what businesses signed up for. And let's say they pay 25 cents when somebody clicked on an ad for a uh, baby crib. That company would pay Google 25 cents. Google would keep 20 cents and pay me a nickel. And so it depended on the word and how much people were fighting over the word. You know, like Viagra, when it came out, was, you know, $30 a click. You know, so it, it, you just, it, you never could tell what the words were going to be worth. But, so anyway, so I did that. So I got up to the point where I was making $4,000 a month off of Google, just off Google AdSense. Within that time, I also found affiliate marketing online, which means you just basically put a link to Amazon. Somebody clicks on it and buys something on Amazon, you get 5% of whatever they buy. So I was making money with the Google AdSense, affiliate marketing, and but really my full-time job was doing the cartoon logos. I'd gotten uh, so popular with the cartoon logos, I was doing logos for, I, I teamed up with a company in China. Um, they uh, were a candy manufacturer, and I still, to this day, find my candy displays in candy stores. You know, I, they, they, I did it cheap enough that they just kept sending me all these displays that I did the, the artwork for their stuff. So anyway, I was really doing more cartooning than anything at that time. So I did that for 10 years. I thought I was going to retire with that. I thought Google AdSense was literally going to be my retirement. I had everything paid off. I had no car payments. Uh, you know, everything was going fine. Um, and then March of 2012 came along. And so that whole time, which made it even funner, was Google ran on an algorithm. And the algorithm was based on different factors. So in the beginning, it was just based on links. Then Google found out that everybody figured that out, so they made it a little more difficult. And so by the time you know we get 10 years down the line, the algorithms for Google got really complicated. So 
not only did you get a little what we called link juice for link, but depending, you know, on who linked to that site, who linked to that site to link it, you know, and so it just all added up. So there was a lot, there was, you know, up to two to 500 different factors on what was causing different websites to rank. The cool thing was Google would switch up their algorithm. So if you don't believe in uh, Russian hacking, you should, because back in the day, actual Russian mafia were trying to control a lot of the websites and they would try to get their prescription sites and stuff ranked number one in Google, but they would use the wrong keywords to get you to go to the website. And then once you got there, they would try to sell you something that they shouldn't have been. So Google was always fighting those guys. Um, and so they were always tweaking the algorithm to try to make the bad spam sites drop. And then me and my guys would get into the forums, the SEO guys, and we would figure out what they did to the algorithm, change our website, and then we would rank number one again. So it was kind of a fun game back and forth until March of 2012. Uh, Google hired a guy from India named Navit Panda, and Navit Panda came up with a really good algorithm, so good that it uh, wiped me out. So March of 2012, I woke up, I had a, you know, a routine that I would do, and I woke up and I looked at my computer and there was no money in my Google AdSense account. I was like, well, that's weird, and I thought, you know, it could be a one-day, one-time thing, you know. Uh, but then my email, I wasn't really getting any email. So I looked at some of my traffic on my websites, no traffic on my websites. And I'm like, well, that's really weird. So I just kind of waited it out for a day. And then the next day, still nothing, no money in Google, you know, just a, a little bit here and there. But I started doing some Google searches for my websites and they were gone. So everything was gone. So literally I became unemployed in March of 2012. Um, what had happened was Navit Panda had, they had turned on the Panda update, if you search for it, you'll find it in Google. Like you said, many businesses went bankrupt. Um, furniture store, million dollar furniture stores that relied solely on their rankings in Google went bankrupt. People were dropping like flies. They were closing their websites down because they just didn't have the ranking, they didn't have the traffic. Luckily for me, I had enough going on locally with my cartooning and my logos and I had enough returning people that I stayed alive, but I didn't like have a steady income coming in. So for a year, I used uh, savings, credit cards, retirement to try to figure out the Panda update. Well, the Panda update was to clean out thin content websites. Well, guess who ranked number one for thin web website? That was me. So of course, so I got hammered for, you know. Anyway, so I lost it all. Uh, March of uh, 2013, well, a little bit before, somewhere in 2013. Um, by then, I'd had two daughters, so I was stay I'd gone full time at staying home, uh, watching my two daughters. So that was my goal: was to be able to stay home with my daughters every day, take them to school, goof around at home in my shorts, go pick them up after school, and then do whatever we wanted. So, um, so again, I was doing that until 2013. So 2013, the wife was starting to get a little annoyed that paychecks weren't coming in, and said, "You got to do something." Well, of course, I didn't want to go get a job. I was not going to go get a job. So I thought, well, what am I doing that's not reliant on Google, you know, 100%? And so in 2005, blogging had become really popular. And so I had started a couple of blogs. Well, Enid Buzz was one of those blogs. And literally, I just posted once a month. I'd post an old memory or an old photo. And I got a couple, maybe three people in town to buy uh, sidebar ads for $10 a month. So you know, it was like $30 a month I was making on it. But at the time, I was making so much money with the other 100 websites, you know, the $30 was just a part of that. Well, when, you know, at this point, the $30 was, was my buying groceries, you know, I was like, so I thought, well, what if I rebuild Enid Buzz into a real website? Because it was still an old HTML hacked website. So uh, WordPress had come out. Uh, oh, oh um, can you get a drink of water? Oh. I'm going to... The, if you want to know all the details about that big shift, it's uh, the book is called The Search, and it's by John Battelle. It's a great book, and it explains in detail the, the disaster that, that happened, but it's called The Search, and it's by John Battelle. One more, th one more book that describes pretty much your whole life and the path, this, this meandering path, following your micro-motivations that's what the book Dark Horse is all about. Finding your micro motivations and you just, and it, it's a different path than when I ask students, what do you want to be doing 10 years from now? It's a different path. Dark Horse is just, you keep following your micro motivations and you'll, you'll end up in some pretty exciting places. Yeah. But Dark Horse is the name of that one. 
Sorry, yeah. Nina, so, sorry. so I would like to write a book called Pivoting. So I want you all to be aware that at some point you're going to have to pivot. Uh, there is n rarely is there going to be a straight line from where you guys are right now to where you think you're going to be in 10 or 20 years. That's, you know, that was my experience. So, so literally five years of college, three years out in the workforce. It was 1986, 1980, well, 1986, 89. Anything I'm doing today had not been invented yet. There was no, you know, it just, there was no phone, you know, there just, the stuff just wasn't around. So I'm literally, most of the stuff that I do day to day today just wasn't even around back then. So, so you've got to learn, I want everybody to, you know, be aware that you're going to have to pivot, your, your path's going to go here and there. So anyway, so uh, was blogging, uh, WordPress came along, WordPress made everything so much easier because uh, when you update, so I would highly recommend, I highly recommend no matter what you're doing, everybody have your own website. I. I don't care if you're just going to sit at home and watch TV. Go ahead and have your own website. Go buy your own domain name if you can. It's probably going to be gone if you have a pretty common name, but uh, just add something to it and you can buy your domain name. You might as well have a part of the uh, real estate online. You never know where you're going to need it. I bought uh, Piper Tucker, Cheney Tucker for my daughters if they ever need it. Um, so anyway, just think everybody needs to be a part of the Internet. Buy your domain name. You don't even have to have a website on it for a while. It's only going to cost you... 10 bucks a year or something. So anyway, so uh, rebuilt enidbuzz.com, put a business directory on there, started to try to get more uh, businesses to come in. So that all of a sudden uh, became my business was, you know, legitimate advertising. Um, I'm a pretty good guy with timing. So right about that time, 2013, 2014, Facebook pages has come out. Well, at that time, Facebook pages did not have an algorithm on it. So anything you would post on Facebook pages would go to everybody that followed you. And uh, so I knew that. So I had 300 people following me. I took off and I thought, you know, Enid Buzz is going to be this directory, this website of everything going on in Enid. So Gaslight Theater, the Symphony, the City, uh, athletic things, these entrepreneur seminars, anything going on in Enid was going to be on Enid Buzz. So everybody could go to one website and just get all the information because I knew people didn't have time to go to 15 different websites and 15 different Facebook pages to get all this information. And then it kind of dawned on me, I thought, well, what if I make the Enid Buzz Facebook page kind of like a ticker tape of what's going on in Enid? So I kid you not, this was my job. My full-time job was Enid Buzz. I started posting on Enid Buzz Facebook page every 30 minutes. So every 30 minutes, I'd have a new update. You know, here's what's going on at the symphony. Here's what's going on at the, you know, Government Springs Park. And then every now and then I'd post an old photo, and those got a lot of response. And then uh, winter would come along, and the school would be closed, so I'd post that the school was closed, and everybody was coming to Enid Buzz to find out when the school was closed. And then, they, then I got this idea of, wow, if I posted jobs. And then people started coming to post jobs and get jobs. And then somebody said, well, the only reason I read other things is for the obits and so I thought well I can post the obits so I started posting the obits and and so the traffic just continued to grow and grow and so now I've become literally a kind of a media company for Enid providing a lot of news a lot of information to people and uh, so some people try to compare me to uh, publications uh, print publications where I'm really more like a, a TV station uh, if you look at channel four five and nine in Oklahoma City and you look at their Facebook pages that's more what I am I go out I can do you know like so like last year I came here and when Paul Allen spoke I, I went live and so people that following it got buzz got to see Paul Allen speak so um, and so my job is never ending there's no I have no set hours I work evenings I work weekends but I I work anytime I want. I wear sneakers everywhere I want. I wear shorts if I want. Um, total freedom on what I'm doing, but I know that I'm obligated now to provide a lot of people their news and information here in Enid. So, um, so that's what I'm doing. So the number one thing that I do is the website. Uh, I've got the Facebook page, which is about uh, 34,000 people now. I've got Instagram, which is really growing, 7,000 people. Uh, in, uh, Twitter, which I love Twitter. I'm transitioning Twitter from Enid Buzz to that Buzz guy, uh, doing a little bit more stuff there. Uh, a mobile app, over 17,000 downloads on that. Um, I've gotten into t-shirt printing again and cartoons. Uh, so we started uh, Bottle Cap Mercantile where we actually bought the silk screening equipment. So I'm back to silk screening my own t-shirts. We opened up a store in downtown Enid, moved it out to Sunset Plaza over the holiday and Right now it's temporary close, but you can get to it online, bcmerc.com if you want to go there. So I uh, started an online radio station called Buzzhead Radio. Uh, if you go to buzzheadradio.com, you can get on there and listen to that. So I'm just, again, every day that I wake up, I'm looking for something to do so I don't have to go get a job. 
that makes money. So, so I'm continuing to do that. Um, so real quick, because, uh, and then if you guys have more questions about Ian and Buzz, uh, you can just get on Enid Buzz or email me, and I can give you more information about that. I want to save a little bit of time. So what I did, because this talk is the 2020 vision, there's 10 things that I'm going to give you real briefly that you, this you might want to write down. I probably should have done a sheet, but this is the things that I see coming up for 2020 that have already worked and are going to continue to work or that will work. Um, branding. Branding is going to be big in 2020, especially personal branding. So if you're a realtor or if you're a plumber and you work for a plumbing company, you know, let's say the plumbing company has five guys working for it. Well, you're not going to be any better, any different than anybody there unless you brand yourself. And now with social media, we literally are all personal brands now. So when you get on your Facebook account, people know you as the person that's vegan, the person that drives a Volkswagen, the person that likes indie music. So you're already creating your own brand if you're online in these social media spaces. Well, the thing is, you can turn that, ter that uh, personal brand and make it a benefit for you and rise up above the company. People will call you on the phone if you're a realtor because you've branded yourself, you've got a name, you've got something that stands out. So have your own website, even though your real estate company has its own website, have your own website with your own name, your own thing. So, so start self-branding yourself, uh, tell your story, let people know what you're about, and that way they follow you because they like your story, they like what you're about. Um, Personal branding goes into number two, which is influencer marketing. So on one side of the thing, people are using influencer marketing a lot, especially on Instagram. Uh, I just, uh, $1.7 billion is what people made on Instagram with personal influence last year. And so personal influence is, is growing. If you become your own personal brand, you can be on the other side of that where you're getting paid to be on Instagram or Twitter or whatever, and people are gonna pay you, which they do me, to promote their product. So what I, by accident one day, Autry had given, or somebody had given me a t-shirt and I took a picture on Instagram and it, you know I got some comments and so I told everybody, hey, if you'll send me a t-shirt with your company logo on it, I will take a picture on Instagram. And got a t-shirt for you. Got a t-shirt, here we go, okay. <laughs> and it, it, I mean, it literally has gotten so popular I can't go anywhere without somebody handing me a shirt or a t-shirt. And so, so now, and I wouldn't say I, it's a, I'm a huge, I'm a, what we call, it's called a micro-influencer. A micro-influencer only needs, you know, between 1 and 1 and 10,000, 1,000 to 10,000 people following them, but if you're an influencer in something where you sell something that costs $25,000, you don't need a million followers. So please, I want everybody to get over the million-dollar follower thing and the making a million dollars and the this and the having 500 employees. You know, you get into a lot of headaches with that stuff. Um, third thing is mobile shopping, mobile payments. Uh, just more and more every day, people are using their phones to uh, do their shopping. If I look at my stats on Enid Buzz, uh, 75 to 80 percent of everybody coming to Enid Buzz is on a mobile device. People are giving up their computers; they're checking their email on their phones. Um, when I'm talking about mobile payments, when you go to if you guys are selling something, e-commerce online, be sure to have choices. Don't just have one payment option. Try to try to add some different payment options because not everybody is on the same system. You know, I got Venmo and PayPal and uh, Apple Pay, and uh, they're just coming out with more and more every day. So be sure that you've got some options on there. If you do build, and I suggest everybody build a website, you've got to have it mobile ready. Uh, with WordPress, you can uh, use a theme that's called responsive, which means if you go to the website on a computer, it's going to look one way, but if you go to it on a mobile device, it's going to look a different way, but on the mobile device, it's going to be readable. If you go to an old HTML website on a mobile device like we used to build, it's those ones that you have to stre you know, mm -hmm. zoom in on to read anything. That means they don't have a responsive website and they are history because people are not going to take the time. So mobile going to be big. Social commerce, it's something really new. I think it's going to be big in the next year. Social commerce, these ladies uh, over in Covington, they've got a shop over there. Well, who wants to drive to Covington to buy a t-shirt? Nobody does. So what those ladies do is they've got a Facebook page and they post a picture of their t-shirt and they say, if you want to buy one, tell me the size and put your email in the comments. They see the email, they send them an invoice, the person pays for it, they get 40 people to pre-order a t-shirt, they send off the order, t-shirt gets printed, two to four weeks later it comes back, they give the people, so people are actually selling now on their social media, Instagram, Facebook, there's even ways of, in, I can incorporate items from my 
bottle caps mercantile store right into my Facebook page now where people can just literally click on it on the Facebook page and pay so uh, social commerce is going to be big um, video uh, I know you know don't think video is going anywhere away anywhere soon TikTok biggest moving social media website out there is going to be huge uh, nothing but video uh, so what people like is when they come to your website, and let's say that uh, there's something that you want them to know or to learn, a lot of people aren't going to want to sit there and read something boring and have the instructions on how to use something for you. So make a video for them. If you've got, you know, um, a piece of equipment and they've got to learn how to use it, do a video. People want to watch, they go to, I mean, YouTube, the set, YouTube, number one, number two behind Google, the most searched search engine because people want to go look at videos to see how to do things. So. Uh, Continue to 60% uh, of shoppers would rather watch a product video than read a product description. So uh, make videos for everything that you do. Podcasting. I think voice uh, audio is going to be big in 2020 and further. Everybody should start their own podcast uh, compared to blogs and websites out there. Uh, podcasting is about this big. You'll hear the numbers and you'll think it sounds big, but it's not. And then what you also find out is, let's say you've got a niche, let's say uh, marketing or being an entrepreneur or business, and you go and there's like 300 podcasts about business. It doesn't matter because if you listen to those, 90% of them are bad. The people say, um, um, or there's something in their voice or you don't like their personality. So I don't care how many people are in your space, start your own podcast. You're going to find your own audience. The thing about podcasting, it builds your personal brand. It all, it, this, is all, this all works together. So, so you're not going to make a lot of money with podcasting in the beginning, but it makes you the guru, the, the expert in whatever your field is. So if you're a realtor you know, and you're doing a podcast and somebody moves to town and they're like, you know, who do I use to buy a house from? And somebody says, well, this person here has a podcast and they, t they talk about all the parks in town and what the best neighborhoods are to live in. Well, they're, they're using their personal brand through a podcast. So uh, learn to use podcasts. It, it can build your authority. Uh, voice, Alexa skills. Uh, Alexa came out or Amazon came out with Alexa skills. I saw it come out one day. I literally hopped on the computer and within 15 minutes, I'd already built my first Alexa skill. So you can go to Alexa and you can say, hey Alexa, what's the daily Enid buzz? And you'll hear my voice and I'll give you the time and temperature of the day and all the things going on. I haven't updated it as much as I should be because it was more of an experiment. Uh, since then, I've already added two more. So voice is gonna be big. Branding is gonna be big. So when somebody, uh, you know, five years from now, you're gonna be ordering everything through voice. You're gonna say, uh, Alexa, I need a loaf of bread. Well, Alexa's going to send you the Amazon loaf of bread, unless you say, Alexa, I want a Curtis loaf of bread. So that's where branding's going to come in. So you've got to brand yourself. You've got to have people know who you are, what your brand is, what it's called. So that's where all this branding comes in. It's going to be big. They say by 2020, businesses will be uh, $40 million in sales using voice commerce alone. Um, live streaming, this is number eight, sorry, number eight, live streaming. Uh, my personal brand, I am now, I'm no longer Curtis Tucker. I am that buzz guy. I did not invent that. Uh, I was sitting in an airport uh, one day, uh, Oklahoma City, 5 a.m. in the morning, somebody walked by and said, hey, you're that buzz guy. You know, I go to a donut shop, they turn around, aren't you Enid Buzz? Aren't you that buzz guy? So uh, I started branding myself that buzz guy, but live streaming is what really did that for me. So before live streaming, a lot of people wondered if the person doing Enid Buzz was this or that or a girl or a group of people. But once I started live streaming, now I can't go anywhere. Yeah, you're the buzz. Hey, I lived, I just moved from South Carolina. Lady stops me in Walmart, screaming down the aisle. Hey, I know who you are. Thanks for chat. I say thanks for chat. I just moved to town from wherever, and I see you on Enid Buzz all the time. Live streaming. I don't know why, and I, I hate to. I keep going to realtors, but I don't know why a realtor doesn't live stream from their Sunday open houses. I don't know why. I, whatever you're doing, there's that opportunity to live stream. So live streaming is going to get bigger. You can live stream on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Um, personalization. If you're doing e-commerce online, personalization personalization is getting bigger and basically what that means is you take the data you need to start getting the data from everybody coming to your store or your website um, there's a thing called Facebook pixel you will want to put a Facebook pixel on your website and that pixel will gather all the info and I mean it gathers information you know what shoe size this lady has what colors her lipstick what shows does sh sh she watch I mean it will gather everything you need to know about people coming to your website and then you take that information 
and you personalize when people come to your website. So um, using different tactics when, you know, so let's say somebody comes to your website and this pixel knows that she likes gloves while she's sitting there looking at things on your website, some gloves can pop up, you know, the three items at the bottom might be gloves. So you're personalizing your, your offerings to these people. And then when you do ads, let's say you go to Facebook and you do a Facebook ad, don't just do one Facebook ad. Do a Facebook ad for everybody in Wacomus, and at the beginning of the ad, say, hey, for you people in Wacomus, when you place the ad, you target Wacomus. You do one for Garber. You do one from Fairview. You might end up doing 20 of them, but that's your job. Your job is to market yourself and your brand yourself. Don't make it easy. Don't just put one ad out there and have it go to everybody, um, you know, because you can target so many different people with ads, especially on Facebook now. So personalization is going to be big. Last thing is chat bots. The funny thing is I didn't know that Tony right over here was going to be here. Tony and I have teamed up with chat bots. I didn't know a whole lot about chat bots until I uh, got with Tony. So what we do now is we've hooked up the Enid Buzz Facebook page with a chat bot. So when somebody comes to Enid Buzz and they leave a comment, they get a message in their Facebook Messenger that says, hey, thanks for leaving a comment. Would you like to be on our Messenger list? Well, they can either click yes or no. If they click yes, they get another message. And it says, well, we send out a weekly email. Would you like to be on our email list? They can either say no or they can give me their email. And so we have built up a email list of 4,500 people and a chatbot list, well, a, a Facebook Messenger list, what, about 8,000 now? 8, 8,000. And so we can target that for our advertisers and do things for those people. So what a chat bot is, is really it's just, it's just an automatic way of getting responses. When you go to a website and there's a little thing in the corner that says, would you like to chat? And it's got a picture of a lady with the thing on. That's not a lady with a thing. It's, it's a chat bot. And so what you do is you say, yeah, I've got a question. And she'll say, well, what's your question? And then you ask the question and they answer it. Well, that's still a chat bot. Until you get to a certain point where the chat bot can't answer the questions anymore, then something is triggered and somebody comes on the line or a voice comes on. So that's where chat bots come in. So that, uh, that's gonna be big. And then one last thing and we can get to questions. Uh, I reached out to a lot of entrepreneurs online. Uh, I follow a lot of them on Twitter. I live by Twitter now. I love Twitter. I hate Facebook. I hate it. I hate it. But I can't get off of it because you guys are addicted to it. Um, Twitter, I reached out to Damon John, uh, one of the sharks on Shark Tank, and I said, hey, I'm talking to uh, this class of entrepreneurs on Thursday. We're talking about uh, the future of e-commerce in 2020. Do you have any tips for him? He gave me three tips. This is for you guys straight from Damon John. He said, number one, don't spread yourself too thin. Concentrate on excelling at selling one thing before expanding. That's number one. Number two, he said, get to know everything you can about your customers so you know how to better serve them. It's kind of funny that some of the things I've been talking about is exactly what he's telling you as well. Number three, he said, customer service is everything. Provide follow-up and ask their opinions. And so that's what you guys need to do uh, with your customers, your clients. Know everything you can about them. That way you can personalize your things and uh, they'll come back to you. So... That's kind of what I have in a nutshell. Do you guys wow. have any questions? Let's give them a hand. All right, you just got your money's worth for the entire, uh, the, the entire rest of the seminar is now canceled because you just got your money's worth. It's all over. Thanks for coming. No, I'm just kidding. But it was fantastic. Oh my goodness.